So this is nursing care of the child with an alteration in skin integrity or an integumentary disorder. So what's different between children and adults? Well, an infant, the epidermis is thin and the blood vessels are very close to the surface. This is one of the reasons that infants lose heat so easily through their skin. But it also makes it so that they can absorb topical medication much more um, easily. And that's true not just of infants, um, children as well. The skin doesn't become the thickness that adults have until later in the teen years. Infants also have more water in their their bodies and that includes in the skin. Uh, so the epidermis is not really tightly bound to the dermis which means friction can cause problems. You can separate the layers resulting in blistering um, or breakdown. Infants also have less pigmentation in their skin which makes them more prone to UV damage and to sunburn. So common treatments that we do for skin disorders, wet dressing, sunscreen, and bathing. So with wet dressing, this is usually um, we're either trying to loosen up so we can get off a crust or something's itchy so you put a, a cool damp compress on it. But pay attention on those, what kind of solution you're supposed to be using. Is it saline? Is it water? Um, and sometimes, especially if we're trying to get dried crusts off, it can hurt, so you may need to premedicate. For sunscreen, uh, this is recommended for all of us, but um, for infants, they have to be over six months to use it. Under six months, they're not mobile, so that's okay, right? You can keep them under the umbrella when you go to the beach, and once they start being mobile, you can slather them up in sunscreen. You want at least a sun protection factor of 15 or more. Fragrance free is best and it should be applied 30 minutes before the exposure. Let it really soak in. Regardless of how high the, the SPF is, it should be reapplied every two hours. People assume that they, if they buy the super high SPF, they don't need to reapply it. The problem is you kind of sweat it off or it just rubs off so it really isn't that much more effective to get those higher um, SPF factors. Um, bathing. Some things like chicken pox just are really itchy and so bathing can help with itchy or irritated skin. Again, fragrance free, dye free, mild soaps. We don't want strong soaps. Those over dry the skin and make it itchier. Colloidal or oatmeal baths are really helpful for when skin's itchy, be sure you pat dry, don't rub, and apply lotion while the skin's still damp. That's what you do with your elderly as well, right? The goal is to seal in the moisture, so don't let the skin fully dry. Common medications, common drugs that we use for uh, integumentary problems, topical antibiotics, topical corticosteroids, antifungals, uh, benzoyl peroxide, this is for acne, um, retinoids again for acne, antihistamines, and uh, for our severe acne, um, isotrentinoin, um, uh, that is Accutane. So for topical antibiotics, infection of the skin, acne, also things like impetigo and follicula folliculitis, uh, infected hair follicles. So you do want to clean first and apply it. Most of these have neomycin in them. If you look at the triple antibiotic, one of the things is neomycin. And most of us develop a little bit of a allergic reaction to neomycin over time. So you want to be careful how much of that you use. Um, so, okay. And topical corticosteroids. So um, things where we're trying to, to bring down that inflammatory reaction like atopic dermatitis which is what we call eczema now and or just a dermatitis something you touch that made a reaction on the skin like um, poison ivy things like that uh, so be careful with those corticosteroids on the face or the genitalia and these are things you're going to keep uncovered antifungals this is ringworm tinea um, or a yeast rash. Uh, so apply a thin layer, 
realize these can take a long time to treat. Uh, benzoyl peroxide for mild acne, avoid the eyes, use it sparingly. Um, they also say be careful it can um, bleach clothing and sheets, things like that. Your retinoids for more severe acne, this really causes the skin to be dry um, and makes it sensitive to um, sunburn more sunburns more easily photosensitivity so be sure that a teen using this uses a sunscreen antihistamines right when you have some sort of an allergy that shows up in the skin or or just an itchy rash but side effects of antihistamines is they make you see sleepy so um, people need to know don't use them if you've got to be up all day or if you're going driving or something like that and then when we use Accutane, um, this works best on the, the cystic acne, so the big sore red kind, and it works well. The problem is it is teratogenic. There are some things that kind of raise the risk of having a baby with anomalies. This pretty much ensures if a girl gets pregnant while she's taking this, she will have anomalies. The baby will have anomalies. Um, so we've got to make sure teens who take this are on um, using some kind of birth control and usually that's a requirement to you have to go on birth control if you're going to use Accutane. Um, it has other side effects too. You need to monitor CBC, uh, lipids and liver panels and then there's been um, some cases where children showed signs of depression using it. So what causes integumentary disorders? Well, exposure to germs, right? Uh, hypersensitivity, those allergic reactions, hormones, that's our acne. Uh, genetic predisposition, some things just run in families. Injuries, you know, skins and scrapes. And then um, darker skin tends to hypertrophy or keloid, meaning it overgrows scar tissue. So when you have a child with a skin alteration, you need to be able to ask the child, do you have an itchy red rash? And then you need to be able to call the provider and describe it. You know, they have a, a pyritic arith arithmetic rash. So these are words I want to make sure that you know what they mean. Macule, papule, annular, pruritus, vesicles, and pustules, scaling, and plaques hypo or hyperpigmented, and then uh, erythema. And here's some um, little pictures and descriptions. Bacterial infections of the skin. These are things like impetigo, folliculitis, cellulitis, MRSA, um, staph infections, and these are often um, staph aureus or group A beta hemolytic staph. Uh, staph and strep are all over our skin. Those are our normal skin germs. The problem is when there's a break in the skin and they get down under that protective layer that we have um, of the skin. Here is characteristic impetigo, right? Again, it's normal skin germs that get down under there. Often it's around the nose from a kid who's had a bad cold and that skin gets broken and then the impetigo um, develops. So this does have these honey looking crusts on it. For the skin to heal, you got to get those crusts off. You can't make new tissue um, with those crusts. So this is where we're going to use just moist compresses, soften them and, and get them off so that new tissue can develop. Um, this is very infectious though, so good hand hygiene. Cellulitis. This is an infection in the tissue, unlike an abscess, which it has a, a head or a pocket of pus. Cellulitis is just diffuse. So antibiotics, but we don't need to open it and drain it. Um, an incision and drainage is done on an abscess, but not cellulitis. Um, so you can see that around her eye. It's just very red and swollen. Scalded skin syndrome. Unfortunately, this is what you see with a staphylococcal infection um, on a newborn. 
So risk factors for getting community acquired MRSA. When MRSA first came out, it was only in the hospitals and now it's out there in the community. So how do you get it? Well, turf burn, so you know, like sliding on turf, um, towel sharing, team sports, daycare and outdoor camps. Fungal infections. Uh, these are tinnias and then depending on where on the body they are, we add the next word. Um, you know, tinea pedis is athlete's foot, right? A fungus of the, the feet. Um, tinea capitis is on the head. Uh, and, you know, in between. Uh, so we describe it by where it is. Even though we call this ringworm, it's fungus. I don't know why it ever got the word worm in there. So we treat it with an antifungal. Realize these take a long time to treat. They often, um, you know, if you've ever had athlete's foot or a ringworm, you realize it takes a long time to get rid of it. Uh, and that's just a really typical picture of ringworm. This is not, it is contagious, but you pretty much need skin to skin t contact. So it's not um, as highly contagious as some other things, which is why things like wrestling, where you're skin to skin, you have sweaty skin against the other sweaty skin. That's where it really spreads. Uh, babies get this down in the diaper area, and this is typical. You can see how it's got little dots. It's sometimes much brighter red than this, but little dots um, away from where the main redness is. Satellite lesions. So that's uh, diaper candidiasis. And again, it's got to be treated with an antifungal, anti-yeast uh, medication. Viruses. A lot of viruses have a rash chicken pox, measles, those sorts of things. And a good description of the rash can help the provider in figuring out what it is. Um, herpes has a characteristic rash. And then uh, many allergies have a rash as well. These are acute hypersensitivity reactions. Um, with babies, we worry about this in the diaper area, especially some diapers have certain scents or powders in them. So if a parent says, my child can't use a certain brand, don't use it on them. Um, contact dermatitis. This is where usually it's soap or something. Wherever it touches the skin, it gets irritated. Uh, chronic hypersensitivity disorder. So this is chronic. This is atopic dermatitis. This is... Um, kind of goes along with allergies and actually it's very closely related to asthma. Allergies, asthma, and atopic dermatitis go together. And then um, just chronic inflammatory disorders that are not from an allergic reaction. They're not a hypersensitivity. These are things like seborrhea and psoriasis and we're not going to talk about those. So here's diaper dermatitis. You can see how red it is but it doesn't have those little satellite dots, satellite lesions. Um, that the, the yeast infection did. So how do we prevent or handle, manage diaper dermatitis? Well, change diapers frequently. Change stool soil diapers as soon as possible. Part of the problem is holding in the moisture. So rubber pants, um, the, you know, anything that holds that moisture in, uh, we want to do gentle soaps and wash the area with a soft cloth. Don't use harsh soap. Don't use a lot of rubbing. Um, use baby wipes, but use the ones with no fragrance, no preservatives. You may have seen at Children's, we have the wet ones, but we also have ones that are dry and you just put water on them and use those. Um, and those are really good for kids who have a lot of um, this diaper dermatitis issues. Uh, once a rash has occurred, we're going to do all those same things, but we're also going to allow the allow it to dry out because one of the problems is keeping it moist, right? So letting this child go with no diapers on for a little bit each day will help to heal it. You can blow dry it. Teach parents to do that, but make sure they're not using a hot blow dryer, that they're using it on the cool setting. And here is typical contact dermatitis. I think he's allergic to the tape. 
And here's our atopic dermatitis, which is our eczema. So 